From the station working for you, this is WRTV News at 6, streaming now. I had hoped that maybe over the holidays things would slow down a bit, and they just really haven't. Now at 6, local hospitals still treating record numbers of COVID-19 patients, and now they're preparing for a spike in cases after the holidays. What they are expecting and what you should know. In a couple of months, Indiana will be the center of the college basketball universe. The entire men's NCAA tournament will be played in the Hoosier State. Brad Brown is live with how it's all going to work. These are people, our kids, relatives, not just numbers. Mothers of murder victims taking a stand and sharing a powerful message, the changes they want to see. Not only did I lose my son, I'm trying to figure out how in the heck am I going to bury him. A deadly weekend in Indianapolis as gun violence continues. The financial burden many families of homicide victims now find themselves facing. Welcome into WRTV News at 6. I'm Amanda Starantino. And I'm Mark Mullins. First tonight, hospitals in central Indiana are preparing for a potential post-holiday surge in COVID-19 patients. Leaders at one local hospital are taking action in ways they say are within their control. Our Alyssa Donovan explains what that means and what you need to know. Now that we're into the new year and holiday celebrations are over, doctors are bracing for the possibility of a surge in COVID-19 patients. A surge hospitals like Franciscan Health may struggle to accommodate. We're uh, still experiencing record high numbers of COVID inpatients. Back in the first months of the pandemic, the highest number of COVID-19 inpatients at the hospital was 47 at any one time. We've been well above double that now for the last several weeks. Between 100 and 115 COVID-19 inpatients on a given day. And now they're preparing for more partly due to the expected post-Christmas, post-holiday surge. Hospitals across Indiana were able to resume elective surgeries as an executive order by Governor Holcomb pausing non-emergent surgeries was lifted last week. Franciscan is continuing the restriction. They'll continue to halt elective surgeries for the next two weeks so that if there is an influx of patients, they'll be able to handle it. Even with the restriction, more COVID patients will still be a challenge. Our critical care capacity has been running at its limit now for several weeks. We, we make uh, the best we can out of the available space that we have. Normally, they'd be accepting transfers from other hospitals, but right now, that is very limited. Doctors with Franciscan Health say over the next two weeks is when someone who potentially was infected at a holiday gathering would start to present symptoms. So they'll recess their restrictions after that. I'm Alyssa Donovan, WRTV. We did ask Franciscan Health if there are any concerns about the new strain of COVID-19. Administrators say not necessarily at this point, and that's because they're so concerned with the numbers they are seeing now, whether it's the original strain or something new. Hospital officials say they just need to worry about treating the patients. More than three dozen newly confirmed coronavirus-related deaths in Indiana and thousands of new cases. The Indiana Department of Health reports 39 additional COVID-related deaths. Since the pandemic began, 8,100 50 Hoosiers have died with the coronavirus. The Department of Health also confirms 3,630 additional cases of COVID-19. A total of more than 529,600 people in Indiana have been diagnosed with the virus. Today, the state of Indiana expanded who can receive the COVID-19 vaccine. Frontline first responders are now eligible to get vaccinated. The Indiana Department of Homeland Security says this includes firefighters, police officers, emergency medical services, first responder volunteers, and reserve officers. Frontline health care workers, long-term care facility residents, and long-term care facility employees have been getting vaccinated since Indiana received its first shipments of the COVID vaccine. Scene. It's not exactly clear who the next group will be to get vaccinated or when. But Dr. Anthony Fauci has said the general population will likely be able to get vaccinated in the second quarter of this year, meaning the April, May and June time frame. Students in Marion County went back to school today after the holiday break. According to the County Health Department, schools are allowed to resume in-person learning today. WRTV Stephanie Wade breaks down how each school district is beginning the spring semester and their hopes for this new year. 
As soon as that first case hit Indiana, I, he, I pulled him. And so he's not, Caden's not been in school since March. Shannon Singerman's children have been e-learning this entire school year. Her son, Caden, has a rare lung disease called primary ciliary dyskinesia and a type of brain tumor. In big words, he's just as big. He's super strong. Because of this, their doctor recommended that all of their children learn from home to minimize the risk of exposure to COVID-19. My kids will be finishing out e-learning. And I mean, honestly, depending on how, you know, how this, how everything goes, it's liable to still be like that again in the fall. I mean, I, I don't want, you know, it's hard to predict what's going to happen. Her kids returned to e-learning today in Wayne Township. The school district moves to in-person classes January 20th. Most Marion County districts also decided to teach virtually Monday with plans to return to in-person later this month, with the exception of Perry Township Schools, which resumed in-person learning today for students K through five with the option to continue virtual. Since there's been spikes in, in COVID after holiday seasons or holidays, uh, we decided as a school district uh, to, to play it safe, so to speak. For Decatur Township, all students will be virtual this week, the superintendent tells me, but he plans to move to a mixture of in-person and hybrid learning next week with the goal to eventually get fully back in person. Let's take the steps that we can control. That's the social distancing, the hand washing. Um, uh, you know, if the vaccine becomes available, uh, looking at that variable. Uh, but, you know, as far as re really working with our community and our, our parents have been tremendous. But I definitely feel like the option, definitely that at least needs to be there, if nothing, if nothing else. I know, I mean, it's hard for me to say, keep them all home because I'm not, I'm not every other parent and I'm not every other student, but I mean, if it means safety for the students and for the teachers and stuff like that, then I think that's what's best. I know it's not ideal, but you know, nothing that we're dealing with right now is ideal. Stephanie Wade, WRTV. To see a full list of how each Marion County school will begin their spring semester, visit our website at WRTV.com. More proof tonight that Indiana is the ultimate basketball state. The NCAA, state officials, and the city of Indianapolis all announced today that the entire 2021 men's NCAA tournament will be played here in Indiana. Most games will be here in the city. Bloomington and West Lafayette are getting in on the action as well. WRTV Sports' Brad Brown is live outside of Lucas Oil Stadium with a look at how all of this will work. Good evening, Brad. Hi, Mark. April of 2021 was scheduled to be Indianapolis's ninth NCAA Final Four here at Lucas Oil Stadium. That was already in the works. Of course, the challenges of the pandemic have trickled all the way through the sports world, and the NCAA tournament will be all here in the state of Indiana. That was announced earlier today by the NCAA. Just how this plan came together really started all the way back in November. Once the NBA season finished up in their bubble setting down in Orlando, the pieces started to fall into place that this would be a good idea for March Madness to not be spread out all over the country and it will indeed be right here focusing in Indianapolis, but also with Bloomington and West Lafayette in the mix as well. Let's take a look at some of the details and how the plan came together that we got announced today from the NCAA. All 68 teams will be coming to Indy for the tournament. Six venues will host games, including Lucas Oil Stadium, Bankers Life Fieldhouse, Hinkle Fieldhouse, and the Fairgrounds Coliseum. IU and Purdue will host first round games at Assembly Hall and at Mackey Arena. Now the plan currently does not include fans in attendance, but that could fall into place in the next few weeks if COVID numbers improve. Beyond March, though, Indianapolis is desperately trying to regain the convention and big event business that drives so much of the economy here. I spoke earlier with Mayor Hogsett and Governor Holcomb, each seeing this as a golden opportunity for Indy to do what it does so well. Indianapolis has proven time and time and time again uh, that uh, we are capable of being uh, a convention and destination, particularly as it relates to sporting events. Uh, location. I do think it gives us the opportunity to prove that we're ready to go and that Indianapolis is on the move again. Let's prove to the world that uh, this isn't our first rodeo, so to speak. We can do this. Uh, we'll just have to pay very close attention to obviously the numbers in each of the communities and then um, make sure all those public health measures are put into place that allow us uh, to uh, to to host these events at the level that's safe. 
The plan is to have all of the teams staying in more than 2,500 hotel rooms downtown, most connected to the convention center. ICC would be the main hub for practices and team meetings, and there is extensive planning in place with health officials on conducting COVID-19 testing for everyone involved. Selection Sunday for the men's NCAA tournament is scheduled for March 14th, and if all goes as planned, the national championship game would be right here at Lucas Oil Stadium on April 5th. Live at Lucas Oil Stadium, Brad Brown, WRTV Sports. And thank you, Brad. As you look ahead to March and into early April, we'll stay in the moment here. So far this winter season, our snow has been missing, hasn't it? 2.7 officially for Indianapolis, when typically by this point we'd have just over 9 inches of snow. I bring this up. We may add a little tonight, a few tenths. We're not talking much, but a light wintry mix will come from the northwest, drop into central Indiana during the overnight hours. That wintry mix most likely 1 a.m. to about 9 a.m. Temperatures will be at or just slightly below freezing, so be aware we may have some slick spots first thing in the morning. As we go into the overnight, see the greens and pinks? There'll be some blues that show up too as we mix rain with some light snow showers as well as maybe some freezing drizzle. I'll finish this timeline for you. We'll go through your hourly Tuesday forecast and, of course, look ahead from there coming up. An employee at a Westside Sam's Club is recovering tonight after what investigators believe was an accidental shooting inside the store. IMPD says the incident happened inside of the Sam's Club off of Rockville Road just after 3 o'clock this afternoon. Officers tell us security in the store heard what they believed was a shot fired. Police detained the man with a gun as a person of interest, not a suspect. Investigators say a woman working inside the store was grazed and emergency crews took her to the hospital. Again, police do believe this was an accidental shooting. Mothers of murder victims gathered downtown today to get detectives to focus on faces, not numbers. As WRTV's Troy Washington explains, the peaceful protest is all about solving more cases and bringing families closure. The reason I'm out here is because my son. My son. Justice for my daughter. These mothers are taking a stand. We all have children that um, were murdered. Unfortunately, I just met them through us losing our, our kids. We've kind of become a support system. In club, none of the members ever wanted to join, but an alliance nonetheless of parents. Today, they got together outside of the city county building in Indianapolis for a peaceful protest. We let them know we're not out here to cause trouble. We want to do what we can to also help them. They said we're not here to beat up on them. We're here to talk to see what can we do to help them solve our cases. They want homicide detectives to take notice. These are people our kids, relatives, not just numbers. There were at least 245 confirmed homicides in 2020. And this mother says her son Chandler Bussey, who was murdered in June 2020, is more than just murder number 95 of the year. We just want them to hear us, hear our voices and our struggle of trying to grieve and fight for justice. The mothers say one detective has already come down there hoping that more detectives will come out, look at their posters, and hear what they have to say. They say they'll do what it takes to keep their kids' cases from going cold. Working for you downtown, Troy Washington, WRTV. The protest started at 7 this morning and just wrapped up about an hour ago. And just four days into the new year, the city of Indianapolis has already seen three deadly shootings. With each homicide is a family who not only has to deal with losing a loved one, but also with the financial burden uh, with a funeral uh, and a burial. WRTV's Megan Sanctorum is working to find out how faith leaders and community members are now stepping up to help. He was found three years ago on 42nd and Post in Brentwood Apartments. Kathy Mann is talking about her 19-year-old son, Trayvon. He had been missing for a few days, and when we got the call, um, he was deceased. That call no mother should ever have to receive. She describes a whirlwind of emotions. His killer or killers still out there. His one-month-old son now without a dad. And on top of all that, a major financial aspect as well. You go to your job to tell them that your son or your child has been murdered. You need his life insurance policy and things like that. And you're expecting to leave out of there with a piece of paper that's going to help you bury your child. And for them to tell you that you don't have that, that is 
just as bad as losing your kid. It's very heavy on these families. Reverend Charles Harrison with Barnes United Methodist Church says this isn't a new issue, but one he's been seeing more families go through as homicide numbers increase. It's heartbreaking when you get the phone call when you're talking with the family. They're already grieving about the fact they have, you know, lost a son or a daughter or a nephew or a niece. But then now trying to, to find the resources to bury them. So faith leaders often step up to help and the community comes together. We do raise money uh, in our churches from church members. A lot of us have funds that we can pull from. And then the larger community, when we send out the message that we need help um, to bury someone, we have gotten great response. Man says she was able to pay for her son's services thanks to community support. It was one less thing to worry about during the darkest of days. Just to be able to know that my community cared enough for me and to see my struggle with this, that they came and decided to help me is a blessing. Working for you, Megan Sanctorum, WRTV. Reverend Harrison says he hopes to eventually start a community fund specifically designed to help families of homicide victims. As for Mann's son, his case remains unsolved, and anyone with information about it is asked to call police. A relatively quiet week in the seven-day forecast will define quiet, but let's start with this. Temperatures will stay in the 30s through the week. After a lot of nail-biting, the Colts are in the playoffs, and it's in large part due to an historic performance by a rookie. Brad Brown with a look at Jonathan Taylor's career day and what's ahead for the Colts. Hey, home store, this is home. Whether it was a walk on the canal, uh, maybe the Monon Trail today, or even Derek Thomas sent me a picture of him out at Fort Harrison State Park, just enjoying temperatures in the 40s in the afternoon with sunshine. Nice combination. Anytime you can cast a shadow, that's a positive. Well, temperatures, they're stuck in the 30s for the next several days. Really, all seven days of the forecast, temperatures will remain close to average. 36 is our average high. We're at 33 in Kokomo, six degrees warmer in Indy, and 41 in Bloomington. As I mentioned, the clouds are returning western Indiana and increasing for the rest of us through the evening hours. We're dry until after midnight, and then it will be a light wintry mix, but we just have to pay attention with temperatures just at freezing or a little below first thing in the morning. This likely to impact um, the morning commute, not in a big way, but again, we just have to watch this. I think maybe a few tenths of an inch of snow. If we see even that much, it would be um, east of a line from Lafayette on down to Seymour. There's your pink and green. Temperatures will be just above freezing when this starts. Then as we go through the overnight, you see it switching in the early morning hours. That's 5 a.m. to the pink and blues. And then as by time we get 7 to 9, that's starting to push out of the state. 38, that'll be the magic number tomorrow afternoon. We'll hold on to lots of clouds through the day. That's the theme Wednesday and Thursday as well, upper 30s with uh, lots of clouds. As I show you the quiet pattern, there'll be weather systems that develop, but the um, pattern keeps these southern storm systems well south of the Ohio River. That's the plan with the next one after tonight, which means I've got the forecast dry through the rest of the work week. There's your northwest wind around 10 to 15 miles per hour through the day tomorrow. After our shaky start to the day, we'll be dry, mostly cloudy and 38 in the afternoon. Seven day forecast, those lows tucked into the 20s, so no Arctic air visiting uh, the Midwest or the Great Lakes, and no big warm ups either. We'll be in the 30s, as you can see, right on through the weekend. That's a look at your seven day forecast. Here's Brad Brown. Brad? Kevin, thanks. Again, recapping our top sports headline from this Monday, the NCAA announcing that the entirety of the 2021 men's basketball tournament will be held in the state of Indiana. Indianapolis, Bloomington, West Lafayette, six venues all over the state. Tournament starts mid-March, culminating here at Lucas Oil Stadium with the national championship game scheduled for April 5th. And that's where we are live this evening as we welcome you downtown. 
Yesterday it was all about the Colts right here. That big AFC wildcard clinching win over the Jacksonville Jaguars. Of course, the star of the day and one of the best performances we've seen here in a very long time came from rookie running back Jonathan Taylor. 253 yard performance on the day. A Colts franchise record. Better than Falk, better than James, better than Dickerson. It all started off with more than 100 yards in the first quarter. In the first half, Taylor had 137 yards. That was one more than all of the Jaguars combined. And 253 at the end of the day. When it was all done, the Colts were moving on to the playoffs and had an awful lot of good things to say about their rookie running back. One thing that you just always got to understand is, you know, you got to be patient. Um, that's something that, you know, my college running back coach, Coach Settle, would always say to me, he's like, just stay patient. He's like, it's going to pop. Just stay patient. So every single game, just listen to my assignment, getting ready to execute before the play and understanding that, hey, if that one doesn't go, Lock in, reset, get ready to do it on the next play because one of them will. Just watching him grow over the year and I try to help him out and be in his ear and help him out. It's uh, really cool for me to see him, you know, keep taking steps and steps and steps. And uh, throughout the year, it's, it's shoestring tackle here, shoestring tackle there. And today he was getting through those things. If you watch his runs early in the season and watch his runs now, watch how better his vision and his contact and everything is. He learned from every mistake that he had. And that's what makes him great. And you've seen it today. Like, it was very... It looked like he was just playing in the backyard. You know, he was just running, like, what do you have, 250, 260? You know, that's, that's, that's un unreal. I mean, that just shows that he's getting better each week. Colts and the Bills will be the opening game of the Wild Card Weekend Saturday at 1 o'clock. We will have the Ravens-Titans game Sunday at 1 right here on WRTV. Browns and the Steelers will finish things off on Sunday night. We'll have plenty of coverage of the Colts coming up for you as the week continues. Tonight at 11, we'll have the Pacers for you, IU as well, both of them playing on the road. We'll see you then. Time for one more break. The news at 6 continues back in the studio after this. Bruce.com. Dry with temperatures in the upper 30s right now in central Indiana. Tomorrow morning, a light wintry mix exiting the area. Temperatures, they'll be in the lower 30s through about 9 a.m. Watch for slick spots. Shouldn't be a huge impact. That's what we expect tomorrow morning. Mark, Amanda. Thank you for making WRTV your choice for news. Yeah, up here next year on WRTV is World News Tonight with David Muir. And then we'll all see you back here at 7.